Thank you so much for spending your morning here with us. I am so honored to be here and to share some of my research and knowledge about the 19th century theater with you. But first, I want to engage you in a thought experiment, if you will. The first thing I'd like you to do is think about this word, melodrama. What image comes to your mind? So in other words, picture this word. What do you see? Well, for many of us, this word usually brings this image to mind. Yes, 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 right? So several of you thought of this image, right? So for those of you who'd like some description, a black-clad, mustachioed villain is tying a woman to the railroad tracks, cackling as he secures his prey. After he scurries away, leaving our helpless heroine on the railroad tracks, we hear a rumble and a whistle in the distance. A train is approaching. Well aware she's in danger, she calls out desperately for help. Just when it seems all hope is lost, a dashing young man appears, right? Our hero. And with a, quick, a few quick movements, he unravels her bonds and removes her from harm's way a slim second before the train rushes by in a satisfying cacophony of smoke and sound. Our heroine has been saved by the hero in the nick of time. By the way, do you recognize this woman in the photograph? Yes? Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. She used this to market a song for, on her album in 2010, Speak Now, which broke all kinds of records. So this sensational scene has, in many ways, come to symbolize melodrama itself, right? It evokes the decadence, extremity, and excess associated with the genre as a whole. Despite the passage of time, fluctuations in taste, the gradual disappearance of railroads and trains, and the transformation of melodrama from genre to joke, the railroad rescue endures. And yet despite its familiarity and ubiquity, this image has a surprisingly complicated and convoluted history. Indeed, as historian Nan Enstead once described it, she once described it as a flamboyant display of historical forgetfulness. The scenario first appeared more than 150 years ago when Augustine Daly included it in his play Under the Gaslight which premiered in New York City in 1867. But look closely at this poster from the 1870s of his play. His railroad sensation, as it was called then, features a man, a one-armed veteran from the Civil War named Snorky, tied to the tracks. And he is saved in the nick of time by the play's heroine, Laura. A century and a half later, this spectacle from a mid-century, mid-19th century melodrama seems progressive, yes? Even feminist, uh, when compared to the version of the scene that persists in our culture today. What did 19th century audiences see in this sensational scene? What politics shaped and informed it? Would the answers to such questions allow us to understand better what we see or what we need to see? in the revised representation that we instantly recognize today. This morning, I'm excited to talk to you about this and other relics of 19th century US theater culture that refuse to let go of our collective imagination. It is one of many scenes, practices, and performance traditions with roots in the 1800s, a century that witnessed dramatic challenges and changes to gender dynamics, racial, racial relations, religious beliefs, scientific theories, and social justice. Many of these changes, or dramatic effects, were imagined, rehearsed, and enacted in theatrical spaces. In other words, the theater was a crucible and an archive of transformation. And in many ways, as theater scholar Joseph Roach once said, the 19th century isn't over yet. Vestiges of melodrama, like this scene, have become embedded in popular culture, revised and repeated over time. Indeed, Daly's Railroad Rescue has appeared in a stunning variety of contexts, ranging from silent films to animated cartoons to blockbuster movies to product advertising. I have this t-shirt, by the way. <laughs> to music videos made by pop singers. On the other hand, 
the more we learn about 19th century theater culture, the more differences in production and consumption we can identify too. So by the time this breakfast is over, I hope to give you a better sense of what theater historians like me are learning about US history and culture more generally by studying the dramas, diaries, periodicals, and ephemera that are becoming increasingly available through digitization projects facilitated by research libraries and their partners like Redex. First, I'll give you an overview of the 19th century theater industry, fo focusing especially on the important role that theater played in people's everyday lives. Toward that end, I'll share some of the things I've discovered by looking at the life and work of Harry Watkins, whose, experience pre whose extensive pre-Civil War diary I recently published in print and online. And finally, I'll return to the amazing, little-known history of the railroad rescue explaining its political and social significance during the 1860s, and tracking some of the ways it persists today in film and television, media that have arguably become our main source of common culture today. So in the United States, the theater inspires fervent passion, intense loyalty, even cliquish elitism in those who love and study it. Some of you have talked to this morning confirm that for me. Um, in English, the word has at least two definitions. Theater as art, referring to the activity of theater and the body of work theater makers generate. And theater as architecture, referring to a building in which dramas are presented. As both edifice and event, refuge and recreation, play and place, the theater is deeply beloved. However, when looking at the 19th century, we need more definitions than these because the theater was also a performance practice, a form of labor, and a community. By attending to these connotations, the chaotic complexities of 19th century US theater culture can be seen more clearly. For me, the most thought-provoking an insightful portal into this fascinating world has been the diary of Harry Watkins, a minor actor, playwright, and stage manager who managed to eke out a living in the theater for more than 40 years. Watkins never achieved the renown he craved, let alone the renown usually required to be mentioned in a presentation like this. His historical significance, if we may call it that, hinges on the fact that he kept this diary from 1845 to 1860, 15 years, recording the plays he saw, the people he met, and the political and social events he witnessed. It's the only known diary of substantial density and scope, nearly 1,200 pages in 13 volumes, written by a US actor during the tumultuous years leading up to the Civil War. Arguably, this makes him the antebellum equivalent of someone you've probably already heard of, Samuel Pepys, the diarist who's, who's, uh, who, who offers the most important primary sources we, source we have about theater during the English Restoration. Watkins appeared on stages in New York, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Alabama, Georgia, Kentucky, Ohio, Virginia, Canada, and England. He performed with some of the brightest stars of the 19th century, and he wrote at least 45 dramas. Despite these achievements, however, Watkins never became famous, never became a household name. As a result, his appearance in historiography has been fleeting and occasional, but Watkins' diary allows us to explore the potential of the average 19th century theater maker. Of course, his chronicle of the pre-Civil War theater is indelibly shaped by his perspective as a white, male, straight, nativist, working-class New Yorker, and as such, it is limited. But his diary rewards careful study, particularly when read alongside other sources from the period. For these reasons, I decided to collaborate with Dr. Naomi Stubbs, a fellow theater historian, and Dr. Scott Dexter, a digital humanist, to make Watkins' diary available to historians, students, genealogists, and anyone else interested in 19th century US culture and society. Our project came to fruition this past October. Our critical edition of the diary, published by University of Michigan Press, features about 40% of the text, selected, edited, and annotated by Naomi and me, and offers readers a detailed and often amusing glimpse of what it was like to live and work as an actor during the years leading up to the Civil War. We've also created an online edition featuring the entire text of the diary. 
encoded in XML following best practices recommended by the Text Encoding Initiative. It, will be, it was designed and will be forever hosted by University of Michigan Library's Digital Collections Division, which I'm sure some of you know about. This edition is free for anyone to access and is searchable by keyword. I've been working with the diary for about 10 years now, which is hard to believe, but 10 years. And its voluminous details and cumulative data have taught me things about 19th century theater that I never knew before or perhaps just never noticed. By reading the diary alongside published dramas like the ones available in the new Redex database, historical newspapers, theater records, and other ephemera, we ha I have been able to identify gaps in scholarship about entertainment culture during the 1800s or outright errors or assumptions we've made. I'd like to share some of those findings with you today. First, the literature we associate most closely with the theater is the so-called legitimate drama, right? Plot-driven plays that were professionally produced and or published. Yet records of actual practice during the 19th century, such as prompt books, many of which are digitized in this new database, these suggest that scripts serve merely as starting points. Prompt books exhibit a wide range of alterations by producers, actors, and stage managers, scenes rearranged, large swaths of dialogue omitted, or entire characters eliminated to meet the needs of a company. For example, Watkins' prompt book for W.H. Smith's temperance drama, The Drunkard, now housed at Houghton Library at Harvard, reveals that his version of the piece was cut from five acts down to four, and Watkins completely removed a main character. In other words, prompt books remind us that when, what audiences actually saw was sometimes quite different from the published dramas that we can read. Even prompt books cannot fully capture what happened on stage. We know that actors added personal flourishes or points to impress the audience, and often they were imperfect in their parts due to last minute casting changes and the extremely limited time they had to memorize lines. Watkins, for example, reports that he sometimes had less than 24 hours to memorize a part before a performance, because most plays were, were offered for only a night or two. Additionally, many scripts have been completely lost for the simple reason they were never intended to be kept. Sassy parodies of well-known plays, slapdash dramatizations of novels, repertory staples retitled, repackaged, and redone, these remains exist only in playbills, newspaper advertisements, and casting records kept by stage managers. As these materials are digitized and made available online, we're gaining a more nuanced understanding of the content and craft of 19th century theater making. Given the astounding diversity of amusements during this period, we must stretch our definition of drama to incorporate what seems less dramatic, too. Read. The New York Clipper, which I know some of you are familiar with, for any period of time, and this becomes obvious. Advertisements of tragedies, comedies, and melodramas, but announcements of magic shows, freak shows, entertainments involving audience participation, like public hypnotisms and laughing gas demonstrations. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> uh, and lectures accompanied by paintings and panoramas. Although we tend to think of these entertainments as discreet and unique. 19th century audiences and artists were not invested in such distinctions. Harry Watkins, for example, spent part of the summer of 1857 on a lecture tour, narrating stories about Dr. Elisha Kane's expedition to the Arctic alongside several paintings depicting the journey. Furthermore, surviving playbills document the many ways that theater managers spiced up their bills with short, interstitial entertainments between dramas, ranging from popular songs and Irish dances to conundrums and blackface minstrelsy. But it would be a mistake to view these amusements simply as seasoning, because some of the century's most celebrated performers, like T.D. Rice and Frank Chanfro, launched their careers by developing such bits. Rice, for example, helped popularize the highly problematic genre of blackface minstrelsy in precisely this way. He performed his infamous Jim Crow song and dance between acts in a drama. And that, that phrase Jim Crow actually comes from this performance in the 19th century. 
In addition, the omnipresence of music and dance on 19th century stages suggests that a focus on scripts obscures how the theater was actually crafted and experienced to some degree. As Michael Pisani has shown, music played a, a crucial role in the amusements offered at playhouses, augmenting and shaping audience reception. In his diary, Watkins shares several stories about protests and walkouts by musicians who did not receive their salaries on time, which almost always stopped a performance in its tracks. During such emergencies, the actors sometimes tried to fill the gap with their own musical talents, and when that wasn't feasible, managers changed the bill or canceled the show altogether. In addition, managers knew audiences expected, expected to see good dancing at their theaters, so they usually hired one or more dancers when putting together an acting company. As Alison Peepmeyer discusses in her book, Out in Public Configurations of Women's Bodies in 19th Century America, 19th century images and discussions of flaming ballet girls, ballerinas whose costumes caught fire in the footlights, attest to both the ubiquity of dancers on stage and the public's fascination with these spectacular bodies. Some performers, including William Henry Lane, an African-American dancer known as Master Juba, and John Diamond, a white dancer who, like Rice, performed in blackface, built entire careers on dance. Furthermore, by considering the many forms of labor involved in theatrical production, we are incorporating into our histories folks who were less visible, but who sustained 19th century US theater culture in crucial ways. To cite just two of many examples, Marvin McAllister has investigated how enslaved and free African Americans performed in whiteface in theaters and other venues during the 19th century. And Heather Nathans has painstakingly tracked the labor of Jewish theater practitioners in the antebellum era. My own research on Harry Watkins, who was neither great nor incompetent, but somewhere in between, has persuaded me that the experiences of workaday laborers provide crucial insights about the rhythms and routines of 19th century theater making. In order to understand this period more fully, we are recovering stories about the decidedly average, the obscure, and the marginalized. In addition, an attention to labor also illuminates the wide range of work performed in theaters by professionals and non-professionals, both. In today's theater industry, practitioners tend to pursue a single specialty, thanks to the formation of unions and trade associations and the inclusion of practical training in educational institutions. In contrast, 19th century theater people were jacks of all trades developing skills as writers, actors, musicians, producers, and marketers in order to sustain themselves. Moreover, non-professionals played important roles in 19th century theater culture. Dramatic clubs regularly staged shows in theaters. A lot of the scripts in the database, I've noticed, were actually marketed to such amateurs who were staging these in homes and other venues. And individuals who could promise a packed house sometimes persuaded professional theater managers to allow them to perform. These labors of love from an earlier era bear striking similarities to today's community theaters. And indeed, community is another key word we must keep in mind when considering 19th century theater. We still have much to learn about how theaters served as epicenters of social networking long before Twitter and Facebook. Like taverns, lyceums, libraries, and Masonic lodges, playhouses served as community centers, providing opportunities for socializing and politicizing. This is somewhat difficult for us to imagine today when the long commercial run of a show is the sought after ideal in our theater, and most theater goers seek out shows rather than venues. For example, please raise your hand if you have heard, ever heard, of Lin-Manuel Miranda's award-winning musical Hamilton, please. <laughs> Yes, pretty much all of you, right? Now, how many of you know the name of the nonprofit off-Broadway theater in New York City where it premiered? Raise your hand. One hand, two hands, three hands. Shout it out. Thank you, the public theater. But that was harder, wasn't it? Now, can anyone raise your hand if you know the name of the theater on Broadway where it is now playing? What is it? Yes, one person knows, and only one. 
You all knew the show, but not the theaters. In stark contrast, during the 1800s, spectators tended to patronize specific theaters, either because they preferred the repertory or it was conveniently located. A lot of theaters are named for the streets where they were, where they were located. Or they liked the troupe of actors working there. Or they felt at home with the audience that patronized the venue. At the Playhouse, people forged and maintained relationships, fostered romances, exchanged news, and relaxed with neighbors. These relationships probably extended well beyond the walls of the auditorium. In addition, it seems that to some extent, norms of comportment were relaxed at theaters <laughs> because spectatorial communities expressed themselves in a wide range of ways. Audiences regularly signaled their admiration, affection, and displeasure about actors and repertory by cheering, throwing things, or simply staying away. A scene in Martin Scorsese's 2002 film, Gangs of New York, some of you may know it, uh, shows this quite vividly. And I'd like to show you uh, his version of a 19th century theater experience right now. Um, and I'll give a little audio description for anyone who would like to have it. We must heal the division between us. This war must cease. North and South must stand My actor. united. What happens at the finish, then? Then we have ourselves a rowdy now. Haven't you never been to the theater before? Uh, Mr. Legree! Lay down your whip. Miss Eliza, join hands with Mr. Shelby. And Topsy, dear little Topsy, cradle Uncle Tom's head. Eliza, nigga, dead! Pretty cliche. So, brief audio description. Uh, this is a production of Uncle Tom's Cabin playing in the five points. And it concludes with the audience screaming and throwing rotten vegetables at the actors. So perhaps, let's see, uh, although it's rare these days for audiences to riot at the theater, <laughs> many people up to and including the current president of the United States believe they have a right to say what the theater should be or not be. Perhaps some of you heard about the night when Michael Pence attended Hamilton in November 2016 when a member of the cast directly addressed him from the stage saying, we truly hope that this show has inspired you to uphold our American values and work on behalf of all of us. Afterwards, the president-elect announced to the actors on Twitter declaring, the theater must always be a safe and special place. But actually, in the United States and elsewhere, theater practitioners have often pushed and protested such demands for safety. Often, the theater is far from safe. It rewards innovation, pursues emotional efficacy, fosters controversy, and inclines toward acceptance and inclusion. When the president-elect further complained that his future VP was subjected to a theater lecture at Hamilton, he evoked the elitism and exclusivity that has alas, become associated with theater today. Now, black mirrors animated by film, television, and streaming videos serve as our main sources of shared culture and amusement. Perhaps this, above all, constitutes the biggest difference between our current moment and our 19th century past. And yet, despite these considerable differences, I still believe the 19th century is not over yet. Let's go back to where we began when I asked you to picture this word. I wrote my first book, Spectacles of Reform, about the many ways in which the theater was unsafe during the 19th century. As I'm sure many of you know, this century was witnessed the great age of reform in the United States. But what you might not know is that many of the political and cultural tensions that we tend to associate with this century were enacted on US stages. In the mid-1800s, thousands of theater goers attended plays, extolling the ideas promoted by temperance, abolition, and women's suffrage reformers. Why were reform-minded reform theater managers and audiences attracted to melodrama, or 
Conversely, why were producers and consumers of melodrama attracted to politics? How did the imagery and emotions embedded in these plays extend beyond the theater's walls? In my quest to answer these questions, I investigated three of the most popular dramas that appeared and reappe reappeared during the 19th century and beyond. The Delirium Tremens, or DTs, in The Drunkard, a temperance melodrama by W.H. Smith from 1844, Eliza Crossing the Ice Flows in dramatizations of Harriet Beecher Stowe's wildly popular novel Uncle Tom's Cabin, first published serially in 1852, and the aforementioned railroad sensation in Dailies Under the Gaslight from 1867. I argue that these spectacles worked in tandem with visual and material culture to convey, allay, and deny urgent concerns about the rights and responsibility of U.S. citizenship. The railroad rescue in particular is a compelling case study demonstrating how 19th century U.S. playwrights, performers, and producers leverage spectacle to articulate ideas. When Under the Gaslight premiered at the World Sisters New York Theater, it was an instant success, playing regularly for about 14 weeks, because this was a time when, in the words of Marvin Fellheim, a month's run meant a real hit. The sheer number of performances reveals that Gaslight was extraordinarily popular. Widely considered one of the most famous spectacles on the American stage and the first train scene to capture the attention of U.S. audiences, his railroad rescue eventually appeared in other melodramas and at the turn of the century in films. As I mentioned to you earlier, in Daly's version, the female protagonist, Laura, breaks out of a locked shed with an ax and saves a one-armed Civil War veteran named Snorky from the tracks. But what I didn't mention earlier is what Snorky says at the end of the scene. And these are the women who ain't to have the vote. What was he talking about? Well, Gaslight premiered in 1867, a time of tremendous political ferment. As Lori Ginsburg notes, women reformers became more active during the 1850s, increasing their demand for legislative suffrage. Although the onset of the Civil War in 1861 shifted everyone's attention to the battlefield, it did not silence women suffragists completely. In May 1863, the, while the war was happening, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Lucy Stone, Angelina Grimke Weld, and other women's rights advocates formed the Women's National Loyal League, an organization dedicated to supporting Union war efforts. When the war ended in 1865 and re Reconstruction commenced, the 13th Amendment was ratified, abolishing slavery throughout the United States. Next, the 14th Amendment, through the 14th Amendment, Congress began establishing rights for formerly enslaved people, including due process and equal protection. But this landmark legislation had a serious downside for women suffragists. It described U.S. inhabitants and citizens as male. Prior to this, electoral participation was unmarked in the Constitution. It was implicitly a male privilege, but not stated as such. The deliberate association of suffrage with sex in the 14th Amendment suggests that members of Congress felt obliged to be explicit. Women activists had generated enough heat that a gendered qualifi qualifier became necessary. The legislation propelled women suffragists to step up their efforts to obtain the vote. For example, in May 1866, members, the members of the Women's Rights Society, formerly a subdivision of William Lloyd Garrison's Anti-Slavery Society, dedicated their organization to the fight for universal suffrage, renaming themselves the American Equal Rights Association, or AERA. Differences in opinion plagued the organization, however. For some women suffragists, such as Anthony and Stanton, the passage of the 14th Amendment represented a huge blow. But others believed that suffrage for African American men would help their cause in the long run. Lucy Stone, for instance, maintained that both populations deserved the, the vote, and she eventually broke with the AERA. Even Frederick Douglass, an ally who had advocated for universal suffrage before the war, began insisting that men of African descent needed the vote more urgently than women did. Frustrated by these colleagues, Anthony and Stanton adopted racist rhetoric, asserting that native-born, 
educated white women were more deserving of the vote than black men. In light of these conflicts, it seems less surprising that Snorky, saved from certain death by the play's heroine, would make a declaration about women's rights at the end of the railroad rescue. And when we dig deeper into the play, we see even more evidence of the social debates about womanhood, womanhood and suffrage that were happening in the wake of the Civil War. In several respects, Laura departs dramatically from our collective vision of the melodramatic heroine. Literary scholar David Grimstead has argued that in melodrama, the heroine's vulnerability and passivity characterizes her goodness. He further observes, the heroine's weakness was such that she had to be carefully sheltered. But Laura is not this kind of heroine. She displays courage, steadiness, and independence in myriad ways long before this climactic moment. Plucky and unconventional, she responds to adversity with laughter. She rejects the apologetic pleas for rec reconciliation offered by her love interest, Ray Trafford. And during the railroad scene, she chops her way out of a locked shed in order to save Snorky. You can see the shed on the left side of this image and the ax still in her hand. We can never know what audiences thought of Snorky's seeming commentary on current events. But this railroad rescue definitely reflects its historical moment, a time of conflict, confusion, mixed messages, and mixed feelings regarding race, gender, and citizenship in the wake of a devastating war. But today, of course, the image that comes to our minds is that of a woman tied to the tracks, saved by the hero. That image is a distorted echo or residue of this one from 1867. It's not altogether clear when or how the scene's gender politics reversed, but apparently at some point America could no longer abide the spectacle of a woman rescuing a man. In After Dark, a melodrama by Dion Busico that premiered just one year after Daly's play, we find a similar railroad scene. In that one, a man, rather than a woman, plays the role of rescuer, but the victim on the tracks is still a man. The next installment in the scenario's history occurs in the early 20th century with the advent of cinema. Scholars such as David Mayer, Christine Gledhill, and others have observed that when film was invented, the plots, techniques, and acting styles of the 19th century theater were absorbed wholesale into silent film. As a result, they're rich archives for theater historians like me because they allow us to see quite literally the conventions and strategies that were employed in playhouses during the 1800s. Female protagonists are tied to the railroad tracks in films like What Happened to Mary, The Perils of Pauline, The Hazards of, Heroine, uh, and the Hazards of Helen. But in all of these, the heroines save themselves. They rarely need a rescuer, male or otherwise. For example, in this film, Teddy at the Throttle, from 1917, which loosely follows the plot of Daly's Under the Gaslight, the villain fastens the heroine, Gloria, to the train tracks. Gloria whistles to her dog, Teddy, who finds her, takes a note from her, and brings the note to her sweetheart, Bobby. The ending has a wonderful twist, and I'd like to show you right now. Um, since it's silent, I'll narrate this a little. We see Teddy running toward the train. We see Bobby uh, at, with Gloria uh, at the tracks. Teddy jumps into the engine cab, alerts the engineer of, of <laughs> Gloria on the tracks. So there she is, Gloria on the tracks. Bark, bark, bark. If only I could hear that. <laughs> and there she is, and Bobby tries to stop the, the hero tries to stop the train. It does not succeed. And she sinks between the ties, saving herself. The train runs over her, and then she gets pulled out. So I suppose, oh, and then of course, this is my favorite part. Teddy goes after the villain. <laughs> I love that. So I suppose you could say that this version is a collaborative rescue involving both human and non-human animals. Um, but ultimately, still, Gloria saves herself. I have yet to pinpoint precisely when the damsel in distress scenario we recognize replaced such scenes, but it had definitely taken hold of the public imagination by the mid-20th century, so after World War II. 
For example, in one episode of the television series Adventures of Superman, which aired during the 1950s, Lois Lane is tied to the tracks and saved in the nick of time uh, by... Can you guess? Superman! So there you have it. Uh, but because I saw it over and over as a child, to me, the most recognizable version is the title sequence for the animated TV show Dudley Do Right, 18, 1969. <laughs> It's, it's classic by the 1960s. So in these two examples, we begin to see the scene that's familiar to us, a blonde damsel tied to the tracks by the villain saved by the hero. Both are products of a sprawling game of telephone played across media and across time. But the dogged persistence of the woman tied to the tracks scenario, I argue, reveals the dramatic effect of Daly's original in 1867. It also reveals the staying power of melodrama more generally, both as an engine and an archive of cultural ideologies. If the iconic damsel in distress who struggles and awaits rescue is, to use the words of French cultural theorist Jean Baudrillard, no longer a question of imitation, nor duplication, nor even parody, but rather a question of substituting signs of the real for the real, then, the damsel's constant reinvention and reiteration is terribly significant. As we discovered at the beginning of this talk, the damsel in distress exists now mainly as the super sign of melodrama, the first image that comes to mind when many of us say or think the word. But her ancestor, her forebear, her prototype is Laura, the strong, courageous heroine in Under the Gaslight who was created and performed at a time when women were fighting for equal rights after the Civil War. That heroine was dramatically repressed and upended when mid-20th century filmmakers and animators transformed her from savior to victim. Why the transformation? Was it a reaction to or an antidote for the empowered heroines that appeared in early film, like Perils of Pauline and Teddy at the Throttle? Was Laura troubling, culturally speaking, because she was not overly aberrant, because she wore a dress rather than bloomers or breeches? Is this why she had to be tied to the tracks over the course of time and history? Is this why she had to take Snorky's place? I imagine many of you in this room could offer some compelling hypotheses about that. Now that the 21st century is underway, and I've, I've observed that new media technologies have elevated the sensation scene to a new level. Now, actual people and real life events are transforming into melodramatic spectacle. Like their theatrical predecessors, these contemporary sensation scenes fascinate and assault us. Apparently, we still crave spectacle, and cultural producers are e eager to profit from that desire. Therefore, I think we should ask ourselves, for example, what kind of cultural work is occurring when a man rescues someone from the subway tracks in New York City and is immediately paraded before the public? This is what happened when Wesley Autry saved Cameron Holopeter from an oncom oncoming train in the New York City subway in 2007. Autry was dubbed by many the subway hero, referring, of course, to that culturally ubiquitous stock character that has its roots in 19th century drama. Autry, a construction worker and Navy veteran, reported that his split-second decision to rescue the man derived from his sense of responsibility to his fellow citizens. As he said to one reporter, if you see somebody in distress, do the right thing. Is it mere coincidence, though, that Autry's rescue mimicked the railroad scene in Under the Gaslight? In all likelihood, he had never encountered Augustin Daly's play. But at some point in his life, he, like all of us, had probably seen an iteration of the railroad rescue in a film, in an advertisement, or in a Dudley Do-Right car cartoon. He was, unconsciously or not, reenacting that sensational scene. Did the railroad spectacle, first popularized a century and a half ago, give Autry faith 
in melodramatic rescues, spurring him to enact one himself? I've been arguing today that to be attuned to the dynamics of 19th century theater, its scale, its intensity, its excess, its enduring influence, is to understand how we see. It, stories that coalesce and congregate around sensational scenes like the railroad rescue have the power to influence and shape our beliefs, our ethics, our actions, even our sense of self. These melodramatic stories teach us what it means to be a hero. They teach us the limits of being the heroine. They teach us how to recognize the heartless, profit-seeking villains in our midst. The next time you find yourself called to action, what role will you play? <laughs>